everyone. Welcome back to Live in Italy Magazine's YouTube channel. I am very excited today to welcome Dina Fenza Williams, who you may know not by name, but by her highly successful blog and social media presence called Micha Mamas. Dina is with us today to help us celebrate Italian American Heritage Month. She is Italian by descent uh, and has started this highly successful blog that focuses on Italian American cuisine and then also some great tips if you are managing a busy family life like she is. So we're going to talk to Dina today about her blog and social media platforms and presence and what she does. But also for those of you who watch us and are really interested in moving to Italy or living in Italy, whether it's permanent or part time, her and her husband have recently purchased their dream home in Tuscany. So we're going to talk to her about that and that's going to be really exciting to know more and you can follow her along as well we'll be putting all those links below so you can follow her and see her journey of moving to tuscany so my name is lisa morales and i am the editor of live in italy magazine a travel and lifestyle publication dedicated to all things italy so hi dina welcome hi thank you for having me i'm so excited to be here today Yes, and what is really great is that we discovered each other on social media. So, and I love food. I have found your platform and your blog so helpful. You just give so many great tips. So, any of the, or anyone who's watching or reading the interview, I hope you follow Dina and get to know what she does. Thanks. So, let's great. So, let's start with where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in New York, uh, Brooklyn, um, and then we moved to Long Island when I was, I believe, six years old, and I've lived on Long Island ever since. I live um, in um, on Northport now, a little small village out in the North Shore of Long Island, and uh, when we first moved, I we were the first to have the big Italian family to move out of Brooklyn, and it was it was funny when we moved, they thought we were moving to another country. Meanwhile, we were moving 45 minutes away, like, oh, into the country like but it's long island it's not really the country but to them you know coming living in you know a borough of new york city long island was the country so we but we when we moved out here we still always got together for sunday dinners whether we traveled back to brooklyn or you know they came out here to the country you know <laughs> and right. uh, you know back then my dad we would at, once a week we, we would get the bread from Brooklyn because there was no good bread here on Long Island. So he would bring the Italian bread back or, you know, if, if you know, from Brooklyn and my mom would freeze the bread. So we would have the good bread for the week, you know? So that was always something that always, I remember, you know, from a little girl of all those little memories of like, you know, part of that, a part of our culture, like the food, everything in our world revolved around your next meal, you know, that's amazing. And that is key to just like the preservation of the Italian culture, isn't it? Sure. And, yeah, and it, I'm third generation. Uh -huh. So I find it very difficult as the generations to go on to really hold on to your culture. And in my family, it was always so important that you did, you know, things that were still part of who your culture was, who your family really was. And you know, whether it be getting together to make the Easter breads or the Struffoli at Christmas, like those things were always something so important to us, even as the time went by and, you know, everyone's so busy, but even during the pandemic, we zoomed and made our Easter breads together as a family on a zoom call. So, wow. you know, it's, it's something that for me is a very big passion. And even with my kids now, you know, um, it's, to carry on those traditions and have that, have them have a sense of culture um, and not lose that. And to understand where they came from is a very big thing for me and my I family. That. I love that. That, that is priceless right there. So let's go back to your, your family history a bit. Your okay. mother and father are both Italian descendants then. Yes. 
And do you know where they originate from? I guess yes. your great grandparents. You said you. Yes. So they came from uh, Naples and Calabria. One of them of of them came from Calabria. The rest came from Naples. So it was all really a very Southern Italian influence in my house. The cuisine, everything. Right. So uh, how was it growing up? Did you did your parents still speak Italian or your grandparents? Uh, my grandparents did, um, mm -hmm. and. It very funny because when my kids were little, I sent them to school to learn the language. And when they came home to talk to grandma, great grandma, about what they learned in class, she had no idea what they were saying because she spoke, spoke a heavy dialect. Right. They learned the proper Italian and I guess the Florentine dialect. And they, you know, she didn't understand what they were saying. But um, we didn't really speak it at home. Uh, my grandparents spoke it. My parents didn't. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, my parents didn't go to Italy for the first time until 2014 when I got married there. And um, wow. yeah, that was their first trip there. You know, it's they grew up in a very Italian American where we lived in Brooklyn was a very Italian American area uh -huh. back then. You almost felt like you were in Italy because all the stores were Italian. The bakeries were Italian. All your friends were Italian. You grew up with this sense of pride for your culture and uh, a sense of like that was your home. Like it was almost like you were living in Italy because the streets were like little Italy. You know, it was it was part of who you were, you know, yes. and festivals. And and it was really hard for my parents to move out. Brooklyn, you know, at the time, my mom wanted to put us in better schools and everyone thought she was crazy for moving to Long Island. But in the long run, everyone except one now of my family members, everyone moved to Long Island. So, oh, well, that's really nice. So you started your own community in yeah. Long Island. <laughs> we are all really my mom's, you know, on my mom's side, at least my dad's side, my two aunts still live in their old homes from back then. But on my mom's side, everybody moved to Long Island and we're all like within 15 minutes of each other. That's amazing. So did, was there business development then in Long Island? Did, are there, you know, from the time that you were there more, you could find more Italian American uh, yes. stores. When we first moved here, there were nothing, there was nothing. And as the time went on, now we have some really good markets here, um, Italian, big Italian American markets. And it's great because now you can really do the good shopping. I mean, there's still some stuff that you can't get out here that you can get back in the old Brooklyn neighborhood, you know, that I go back for pizza, you know, uh, growing up, we would have these, uh, even though my family was from Naples and Calabria, we would have panelli which is a uh, sicilian street food it's like a chickpea pat patty um, right and the famous place in brooklyn that we would go to for panelli sandwiches usually on a friday night because most of the time on a friday night we didn't eat meat right um, so you know it was it, but everyone now is out here we still get together um for all of the family holidays um the feast of the seven fishes I know it's a very big Italian American thing, not necessarily in, in, yeah, in, in Italy, but we have it here at my home and I will feed seven courses of fish to 50 people. Wow. And even the, during the pandemic, I was crazy about keeping the tradition alive. And that first Christmas, after all of this happened, I put a huge tent in my backyard. I bought a medical grade uh, air purifier. I got uh -huh. heaters. I left part of the tent open and we still had Christmas Eve. And you know what? Thank God everybody stayed healthy. We wore masks. I had antibacterial all over the place. And yeah. we were able to still do it, you know? And it, it was hard because people were nervous and, but we still accomplished it and still kept that tradition that in my family is probably that dinner on christmas eve is probably 65 years and strong like right and i it, anything to really stop us and i felt like i was really being safe and i providing everybody with an atmosphere they would if they went out for dinner at that point to a restaurant in a tent you know right. i recreate that in my backyard 
for Christmas Eve. So it was tough. It was a little scary, but we got it done and everyone stayed healthy. Thank God. Yeah. 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 Because I I mean, family is key. And I know from, you know, our writers and our contacts in Italy, I mean, the lack of the embrace, the whole social element around food. I mean, it was really, really difficult in Italy because, I mean, their lockdown was just so much longer than we ever experienced here. Um, so, yeah, I, I can only imagine. So I just want to go back a little bit because obviously, I mean, it is fascinating that your connection to your heritage has been through what has been made here in the United States. And you talk about your parents and we'll get into your wedding and family in a little bit. But what, when was the first time you went to Italy? What drew you there? I went to Italy the first time when I was a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. I, um, we went on a school trip and my, let me just preface this, that my family is very, my parents were very strict. Right. Like them, the thought of set they, I came home and I was like, mom and dad, there's a trip to Italy and I want to go. And my best friend, who's also Italian and her family was just as strict as mine. They were like, oh no, you're not going. And I was like, we really want to go, Teresa. And I really want to go, please, please, please. We get to go see our country. And, you know, I've always been fascinated by it and the culture and, you know, you see these things. And I think right around then, maybe the movie Under the Tuscan Sun came out. I'm not really (laughs) sure. But anyway, so they agreed to let us go if the school allowed my aunt to be our chaperone. Right. So I went to a small Catholic school here on Long Island. My uh-huh. parents were the principal. Okay. And they're like, you can go and Teresa can go if Roseanne goes, my aunt. So my aunt, they allowed my aunt to go. She was a young aunt at the time. I'm the oldest grandchild and my family's are is big. So my aunts are young. And so she's only like 10 years older than me. So she was excited to go to Italy. She had never been there before. And we went. And for me, it was an instant connection. I felt like I was at home. Like there was a peace that came over me. It was, it's really weird, but I, I, I can't even describe it. And I probably didn't put it to words the right way. It was just like, I felt like I belonged. Right. Maybe familiar or the culture was was similar to me and I didn't speak the language I didn't take Italian in high school at that point you know I'm third generation we didn't speak it at home um I didn't take formal Italian until I went to college and then and and then put it, it was, is I'm able to put it together now um to understand it but not to really speak it back but it was an instantaneous love affair for me I right. I didn't want to come home. And then, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go back until um, I believe we were planning my wedding in 2014. So there was a long gap and I couldn't wait to go back. But, you know, financially, it wasn't possible or, right. you know, kids at the time. So, yeah, it, it, it was definitely an instant connection. Yes, I, I think... Um you know, we have one of our writers is Italian American, and she just always tells me, you just don't understand what I feel. (laughs) And like, what I feel when I'm not there, like she goes, she tries to go twice a year. Um, There is and that's amazing to know of that connection. So what area of Italy did you go on this uh, high school trip? It was one of those wake up at five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I forget the tour guide was Francesca and she would you you know you're a high school kid you get on this bus with your friends you're tired and she would be like I'll never forget her big thing was wakey wakey and (laughs) she was talking on the microphone and it was like you know under the Tuscan sun when she gets on the bus like that we literally traveled Italy for 14 days on a bus we went to Tuscany we went south to you know, all those beautiful areas, Positano, Capri, like, wow, Rome, Florence. And I think we ended up in Milan, but yeah, we, that's a lot (laughs) in what? 10 days. Yes. It was nonstop, but you got to see all the little incredible things. And my best friend, her uh, uh, grandfather lived there and a funny story so the food that they took us to have on these tours, you know, it's like tourist traps. Yeah. So 
Italy and the first two nights we there, were there and we're like, what's with this food? It's not as good as our food at home. Like, and so we called her grandfather on the phone and he was like, that's because you're at the tourist traps. You got to go to the real Italian restaurants. Yeah. So the father sent us a guy. We were in Sor Sorrento that night. We had to, he, <laughs> he sent a guy to our hotel to take us to different restaurants to a restaurant for dinner. And then every city that we went to, we actually left our group because we're like, we're not eating this food. <laughs> so we actually went and we did our own thing for food. Right. So, because, you know, when you go to the tourist traps, they're not, no, it's, it's bad. A, it's bad. It's yeah. bad. <laughs> oh, am I eating at the Olive Garden? Like this is not, yeah. not the food that I thought. And I seriously overpriced. It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. So that yeah. was uh, in all the areas that we were there. That's for sure. That is great. So let's go a bit back to your family, uh, your, your, your parents and that. So you said you are the oldest. So how many siblings do you have? Oh, there are four of us. Okay. So four. And, and um, so this deep connection of food, because obviously we're going to get into your blog and what you've been doing and, and your history, because you've had a career in food as well before this blog. Um, were you part of the the process of preparing family dinners as a child? Like, when did it start? When did your connection of food start? Put it that way. Uh, I think the first time I made homemade ravioli, I was like eight years old. And I was mm. so excited to make it. It was a Saturday night. And I was like, I want to make fresh pasta. I made ravioli. And I set the table. And, you know, setting the table was always a big deal. Like, one of us always participated in that for the family to always sit down. Um, I guess the thing for me is we always had a meal at, for dinner and we always sat down together. Right. And me now in America, you're so busy with your kids. You're running from practice to fields to, you know, extracurricular activities with your kids. And there's no family time. Like, right. so me, like when I had children, uh, to me, I was obsessed with, we still have to have that family time. We have to have meals together. And a lot of that grew out of me being in the kitchen with my mom growing up cooking or cleaning up or um, my grandfather, my both grandfathers always had restaurants. And my one grandfather, my dad's dad, um, his family was of Neapolitan deep uh, descent. We... I spent a lot of time at their house and he would come home from the restaurant in the middle of the night and cook a meal for the next day in the middle mm -hmm. of the night. And so wow. I remember in the middle of the night, I would smell all these good smells in my grandmother's room and they lived in a typical two family home, three floors in Brooklyn right. and they had kitchens and we went down, I went to go downstairs and he'd be like, okay, peel the garlic. Okay, do this. You know, so I would want to do it. I was interested right. in it. And he taught me a lot. Both of my sets of grandparents really taught me how to cook in, in their ways, you know? And so began this journey with food. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was natural. Yeah. Yeah. Not just an obligation. That That's beautiful. So growing up, um, I know, I believe you went to Fordham University, right? I did. Yes. So what did you study? I actually studied journalism. Mm-hmm wanted to be a sports broadcaster and wow. I, I have a big passion for baseball, football, hockey. Um, and I wanted to be the first female broadcaster for the New York Yankees. Oh, um, great. And I did end up interning for the Yankees in 96 when they won the world series. It was a great experience. Oh, that's an amazing time. Wow. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, amazing. Um, and, uh, then I went and I worked a little bit in TV, but then I met my ex-husband and besides the fact that my, as I said, my family was very strict. So the, me being in TV and saying, Oh mom, I want to go work or dad really. Cause he was really the decision maker. Mm -hmm. um, uh, dad. Yeah. You know, there's this job in Boston or there's this job in whatever, you know, city. And he'd be like, well, you're not moving. Like, mm -hmm. no, you stay here. And, you know, to crack into the New York market as a kid, I mean, you have to kind of go pay your dues around yes. the country and then you come back to New York, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So the way it evolved back then for me was, you know, I was working in TV and honestly, it really, at that point, I don't know. I didn't it, like the connection was there because I did still love it. But then I met my, my, as I said, my ex-husband and we decided to get married and start a family. Um, so right when we got married, something that always was a love of mine too is children and teaching. So I went back to school um, and I became a third grade teacher for a few years um, in Queens. And I would travel back and forth, which was fine for me because it was in an air, it was cross bay off uh, um, an area of right by Howard Beach. So the area was very familiar to me. It was, um, I actually taught in Bell Harbor in Queens at a Catholic school. And um, I loved it. I loved teaching for me was my favorite like better than that when the TV work it, I, I loved my kids uh, to this day. I still have connections with a lot of them, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, it's just, it's, it's, it was a great memory. Like, and you know, it was back in like the early two thousands right. um, and, you know, being that it's nine 11 tomorrow, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it went through in that area, a really crazy time because Everyone in that area was either a cop or a police officer. I mean, yeah. a police officer or a fireman. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, through the tragedy of it all and all the loss, we built an amazing community down there of support. And, you know, I have remained close to some of the families that I, I taught, you know, all that back in 2001, you know, right. so. Um, and then I had my daughter, Katerina, uh -huh. and decided to stay home for a few years with the kids. And then financially, I couldn't stay home anymore. But so then I'm like, all right, let me think outside the box. I love mm -hmm. food. So I started catering. Um, and then it evolved into cooking classes. And it was great because I still had flexibility of schedule, but I was able to plan the cooking classes in the evening when my ex-husband was home. Um, but then it certainly, it was very important to me, you know, religion is, um, so I had my kids in Catholic school and, right. you know, expensive the tuition. And I was like, okay, you know, if we're going to keep them in Catholic school, I have to go back to work. So at the time I had a friend who had a restaurant, I started working in the restaurant. Then I was promoted to manager. Then I opened up a restaurant with him and a group of other investors, um, helped them open it. I wasn't financially obligated yes. to it. Um, and then back in 2013, I found a spot of my own and I opened up my own restaurant. Actually, no, it was 2012. Started my own restaurant. Um, I had that for two years. And at that point I had worked so much and, right. you know, it was a year that it, my landlord wanted to raise the rent. And it was, it, it got to the point at that point I was divorced I had met my now husband, mm -hmm. and like, you know, we have to really weigh if you working 80 hours a week, yes, worth it. Like the child care had to be paid for the kids really needed me. My, my, my spot, my restaurant was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And things had an Italian spin, of course, to mm -hmm. it, but it was a lot because you were up early and you know, it was very difficult to, you know, you had employee, the employees were the most difficult part for me. And mm -hmm. I think typical for many restaurant owners is that, you know, when you feel you have to be there every single minute, because if you're not, that's is going to goof off and do something. Right. Or these kids that come to work for you as a waiter or a waitress, and they're out all night partying and then have to report for a breakfast shift. And you see it on Facebook, but they bang out for work. You know, so, and then who's there at six o'clock in the morning, me to open and, you know, be the server. And, but I have to get my kids to school. Right. So at that point, we, my husband and I, between us have five kids. He's like, he owns his own business. He's like, I can't do the five kids by myself. Right. So we decided to close the restaurant. And then I have basically been home with the kids ever since then. And, and to be quite honest, I think it's the, one of the best decisions I've ever made. 
well, this is it. This is why I was surprising, you know, like you said, it was like kind of an economic need at that time in your life, but to raise children. And I mean, anyone who has, knows anything about running a restaurant, I mean, you have to give your life to it. And a lot of times personal life breaks down because of a restaurant, because of the amount yeah. of hours. Um, so that that's incredible that you were able to do that. But I think that was um, we're going to get into what you're doing now. But I think really that was kind of the foundation of your journey to where you are now. Right. A hundred percent. You're right. So before we go into that, let's talk a bit about your current family. So you're remarried. So together you have how many children? Five. And what are their ages? So I have uh, three children. Uh, my oldest is Katerina. Then I have mm -hmm. Christopher. He's 19, Christopher's 18, and then my youngest, who's still in high school, Andrew, he's 16. And then I have two stepchildren, they're 21 and 19. So our two girls are the same age. So, oh, wow. And are you all still living together in, in one home? Um, no, because my old, the four oldest are in college now. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, but prior to that, prior to college. Prior to that, my three kids live with us full time unless they went to their dad's house. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then uh, my stepchildren would come here during the week and on every other weekend, um, they didn't live here full time, but they were certainly here with us. And we did make it a really big point to always travel together as a family, um, right. from the very beginning of our relationship too. Right. So, uh, it's a so relationship. So, you know, we co-parent and we speak to each other really every single day about our children and, you know, things that have to be done. And so it's, you know, it's worked out, thank thankfully. That's beautiful. That's really nice. I mean, uh, and so I'm guessing because of the Williams, your husband is not Italian-American. No, he's not Italian. <laughs> so was yes. that a bit of a culture shock? <laughs> Um, you know what? I have to tell you, this man has embraced it like it was his own. Wow. It, it, you know, here I am. I'm a mom with three kids. And it's funny because when I, he first started approaching me to date, I, I was like, what is this guy doing? He's going to marry. He wants to be with me. I have three kids. What is he going to do with a woman that owns a restaurant wow. and has three kids? Like, and, you know, it was, but he embraced it. The family, you know, my family can be a little intimidating for a person who doesn't understand the culture. You know, we're always together. We talk all the time. Like, you know, we're on the phone constantly. Everyone's involved in everyone's business, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For him, he loved it right from the beginning. And then we wanted to get married and, and, you know, we had both had the big weddings before and right. we, Thoroughly want that again. So we're like, you know what? We'll invite everybody. We both have big families. His family is Irish American and his grandma came from Ireland, a huge family. And mm. but let's just go get married in Italy and whoever wants to come, comes. And it turns out that 50 people of our family came to, I got married in Castello Banfi um, in Montalcino, Tuscany. Yes. I saw and, that. <laughs> and it was incredible. I mean, we, we basically, most of everyone stayed on premise. There was a farmhouse that people stayed at and then at the main hotel. And I even shared on my Instagram and my TikTok, I was just back there um, last summer. Right. And it was back and it was three days of the whole family together. And my family at that point hadn't really been all together as far as in a living situation since Brooklyn, where, you know, when I lived in Brooklyn, my aunt lived two doors down, you know, my cousins lived right down the block and you would literally see them all the time. You could like shout to their houses. And when we were back in Italy, it was, we were all, Castello Banfi is set up not in like a high rise hotel situation. It used to be an old village right. and they remade the schoolhouse into a hotel room and, you know, old living quarters and the farmhouse and everything is like little buildings. So you would be able to look at down at your window and there's your cousins and there's your aunt. And, you know, so it was the, it was very, for the whole family, the first time that we, actually did that 
in so long. And we, we had a, a family pick, a barbecue the first night and we had the accordion player with the Italian music. And it was an incredible three days, I have to tell you. It sounds amazing and very, it must have been a very moving experience for your parents because you said that that was their first time in Italy. That was and their- there you recreated your own family village in Castello Banfi. And everyone talks about it. Everyone wants us to have a reunion. <laughs> um, I'm trying to plan something for the summer, hopefully at my home in Tuscany, mm-hmm. if it's done. Yeah. And- <laughs> And, you know, that's always, that's been a, a thing too. It's a massive construction project. I, will, I know we'll get to that. Um, yeah, yeah but we will. Everyone talks about it. Every holiday, when are we having the reunion? When are we going? And, you know, I'm hoping to make that a reality and this time do it at my home, which would be incredible this summer, this coming summer. Yeah, that would be amazing. Okay, so before we go to the home, let's okay. talk about... One of mine, one of ours, because I know readers, anyone that has anything to do with Italy, favorite subject, and that's food. So we were talking a little bit, Dina and I, before we started recording this this video about the founding of Michamamas. So yeah. we, we always do the shout out at the end, but tell us the, the, the handle so anybody who's watching up until this point can find it. Yeah, so you could find me on TikTok and on Instagram. Um, I actually just started Facebook, but it's a lot for social media to you know manage yes, everything. Of course, little baby steps at once. I first we first started on um uh, Instagram. Uh, it's Micha Mamas M I C I A M A M M A S. Right. We started with four, four girlfriends, but you know it's this could be a lot of work. And for me, it turned into a passion that developed over the pandemic. And now it's just me. Um, And, you know, for a while I did it there with my really good friend, Lisa, after the first two moms or friends uh, decided they didn't want to do it anymore. And then it became a lot for Lisa because she's works full time. And that was a year ago. And I've basically been doing it now almost exactly a year ago um, all by myself. So, right. Yeah. I started on TikTok um, this past February. You know, I added that and, you know, it's, it's, it's fun for me. Like this kind of brings together for me, all of my passions, like that are culminating of what I wanted to really do in my life, starting off with like the journalism part and then the, um, the teaching part. So the love of food, you know, the love of my culture. So this is all kind of come together for me into this, you know, social media outlet. And I have a website now with all of my recipes on it. And, um, you know, you can go there and access any of my recipes, whether they be my own or my own family recipes. So it's all, it's all there. Whether you go to my website, whether you go to, you know, my videos, I give full instructional videos of how to make the dishes. And it's so funny because people are like, oh my God, you cook for your family all the time. And all of my dishes are simple. Like I don't, the complex dishes or anything too fancy, not my thing. Like I'm too busy. You know, I have kids, you know, now with four being away at college and just the one home, I think I could certainly dedicate more time to it. Um, but for me, it was always on the go. How do I get a meal on my family for my family on the table so that we could actually sit together, talk about our day for 20 minutes, and then everyone go about their business. And I think my husband and I have done a really good job with our kids because my, especially my children were very involved with sports, football, baseball, lacrosse, um, soccer. So all uh, like weeknights, we didn't get home until later. But mm-hmm. even when my stepkids were here, we sat at that dinner table and we had a meal together um, and we talked about our day. We found out what was going on in each other's lives. And it might have right. only been minutes. And mm-hmm. there's not that typical sit down Italian three course meal, you know, but we did it. And we, then the kids would go about doing their homework or taking a shower or I'll clean up. And, but we still made that a really big focus of our lives. And, you know, I think that that time together is really important for kids and families to really grow a bond. And I, I think that for me, 
growing up in a family where we always had Sunday dinners or we always had dinner every night together. Like those things really made my family close. And, right. and, I, and those are the kind of values that I want to pass on to my kids that I hope that they'll do with their children. Um, and I just, you know, even like my main goal here is to show moms, like you can cook for your family and you don't have to throw processed food on the table for your kids. You can make your lunch, right? You know, it's not, if you're organized, you know, I used to work 70 hours a week, like mm -hmm. 80 hours running restaurants or when I had um, my own and I still put on the table for my kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, I went nonstop at that point when I worked those kind of hours, but as long as you stay organized and you plan out, like it's possible. Yeah, it really. Yeah, it, it is extra work. And I think that's one thing that I found so inspiring about your, your, your channel. When I say channel, I'm talking about, you know, I'm either following Dina on TikTok uh, or Instagram. And then when I need the actual recipe, I'll go on. Is that one thing I think that you've brought is like, this is not just about fast family prep, healthy eating. It's about that communal bedtime together. And I think even if we do the whole food prep thing and have it ready, I mean, are we sitting down no matter what time of the day it is and having a meal together? I, th I think that's really beautiful. And I, I noticed one of your most recent ones was, I mean, that extension of food into your kids' lunches, you're showing like fast and easy and beautiful, a healthy uh, pasta salad for your kids that you put in bento box. So as they go about their day too, they're kind of taking that tradition with them. Yes. Was that part of your intention? Yes. And then, or you leave a little note in their lunchbox, you know, that's now so cute. No, it's anymore. They're afraid their friends will see them. But, you know, like those little things, like, you know, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure we'll get to it eventually. Like the food in this country is so processed. And like, I think mm -hmm. one of the things I love about going to Italy is like, like I can't have ice cream here. Like, but when I go to Italy, I can eat gelato and I can have gelato twice a day and my stomach is not bothered. Right. I can eat pasta and not feel bloated. So for me, like the ingredients that we use and not eating processed food, just from our own health standpoint, like, you know, is really important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And giving my kids, we're sending my kids to school with lunch and not them eating something that like, is at school, something processed, if not healthy ingredients or good quality ingredients to me was always an important thing for me from when my kids were little up to now, right. you know, my, my son just left for college and he plays football college. So he loves to eat this kid since he was a baby would eat anything you put in front of him, a fabulous eater. So he's like, mom, I'm nervous about college food. So I made him little things of tomato sauce to put in his free little free uh, pool and it. go get plain pasta at the cafeteria and put it on your pasta. And I gave him little things of grated cheese, you know, <laughs> you know, trying my best to keep him still eating well in college and, you know. Hopefully, Karen. And, and yeah, see, so I mean, I'm sure you're almost guaranteed that what you do for them, they're going to carry on into adulthood because, like, the standard has been so high, uh, yes. they will expect it. So let's let's go back a bit because some of a couple of the things we were talking about was the founding of um, Micha Mamas, and we were talking before we started recording, and. So it's important for you to know, which I find this incredible as we, as a magazine, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I call it the Pandemic Passion Project, is that you started during the pandemic. And just on TikTok, you have, you know, close to 112,000 followers, uh, which is incredible. So, uh, you know, you, you've built this audience that are interested in what you do. So tell us. What year did you start and how about? Because I know we had that thing about going to St. Martin in common. Yeah, so we went to St. Martin, a bunch of girlfriends, and we decided to let's let's start this. Ha ha, this in 2020, season. right? 20, right, literally before mm -hmm. shutdown. Okay. Like, came home and there was chirps about this pandemic. And what was, was that what, March or? Was uh, early February, I think. Yeah, okay. Well, everyone was talking about it at that point, you know, and... So we um, uh, basically uh, 
talked about it. Then we came back and then all of a sudden now we're all home. And we're like, you know, this would be fun to start. So we started, I think it was like maybe May that year or April or something, just starting to do mom posts. And um, then it kind of, all of us are Italian American, all the, the four moms. So all it okay. kind of evolved into let's share things, moms, Italian American. Um, and then, you know, you know, things loosened up as far as the uh, pandemic is concerned. And then, you know, who was a teacher who was, you know, they didn't want to do it anymore. Um, so then it was just Lisa and I. And then mm -hmm. as I a year ago was when Lisa was like, I can't do this. It's so much, you know, she works full time and I totally got it, get it. And she's of my closest friends on earth. Like I could trust her with my life literally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she decided it wasn't, she couldn't do it anymore. So that's when I was like, all right, well, do you mind if I keep going? And she's like, no, absolutely not. Keep doing it. And I, I did. Right. And I'm happy. So I, what is, what is your goal? What, what, what is the most, because like, I mean, I understand, you know, like I was going to say that when you said that you were a teacher, I mean, that is just so obvious in what you do, but what do you want to project to your audience? What do you want them to get out of it? Um, I think I, well, at first, like I said, I want them to understand that you can cook for your family and that it could be simple if you plan. Mm -hmm. um, other thing, you know, eventually I would like to, and I've started writing, you know, I have my website. So a lot of the recipes that were never written down are written down now. So, you know, I'm, I, now I'm starting to kind of put together on, in a binder, all of the best ones that I have and maybe publish a cookbook. Yeah. Uh, Woman Tuscany um, has olive trees. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there's been a terrible year for olives in Tuscany um, with the uh, heat yeah. and rain in Tuscany. So, right. this is probably one of the worst years ever for Tuscan olive oil, and there's no olives on the trees. So, and yeah. if they're well to the ground, they burned. Uh, there was a hailstorm a couple of weeks ago that really kind of whatever was left really obliterated it. And it's sad because, you know, you have people who are dependent on these crops. You know, for me, I'm not dependent on it. It's on my property. And, you know, I want to go through the whole process of, you know, maybe selling my olive oil from my Tuscan villa in the States. Um, maybe that'll happen next year, but definitely not this year. There's there's no olives. Um, but that's another thing that I would love to do is, you know, make my own olive oil and sell it here. Right. Yeah. That's if an amazing goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that that's this year, but hopefully it will be better. So before we go into your Tuscan home, we have interviewed Italians and we've interviewed, you know, Italians uh, who are specialists in food as well. And one of the first interviews uh, we had was the Foodie Sisters and their, their motto is um, there's no such thing as Italian food, Italian food as they know it. Because if you are in Italy, they tend to want to be able to say, regional Italian food, because as yep. you know very well, um, every region is different. But what, and also a lot of Italians are kind of a snobbish about Italian American food. Like they don't think it's the real deal or yep. their perception is the Olive Garden, like you were saying, or fast. What, what is your response to that? Um, your Italian American well what do you define as Italian yeah. food? It's funny because being on social media, you will you expose yourself to mm -hmm. that. You talked about the snobby, you know, I know food better than you or, you know, and you'll get those negative comments. You know, I had a something on TikTok go viral basically. And there was so many comments and, and, and things mostly positive. But then you'll have those few who will be like, well, you know, growing up, we didn't say mozzarella. We said mozzarella. Mm -hmm. and like in Brooklyn, where we came from, Italian Americans are all there. That's what we called mozzarella. We didn't call it mozzarella. We call it mozzarella. So I would get criticized because, oh, I'm not saying it right. But, mm -hmm. okay, but this is how I grew up saying it, you know, like. Yeah. 
you know, you want to respect that people in Italy have different dialects and different regions. Well, here in the United States, when the Italians came over, this was our dialect. This is how we said it. Right. So don't be critical of it. You know, embrace right. the fact. I had one man a couple of weeks ago on TikTok. Like, I shared a, a recipe for a scropino, which is mm -hmm. a uh, a drink that you make with sorbet and prosecco and um I saw that. and you blend it and it's this incredibly lemony refreshing delicious drink with lemon uh -huh. sorbet uh-huh he sends me a message and he, or, or a comment oh i don't know where you americans get this from but it must be one of your tourist traps so i respond nicely actually i had it in an italian beach club many different italian beach clubs at different times it doesn't exist here what beach club was it? So I, I'm trying to remember. Now I'm like, why am I arguing with this man? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, we've had that too. <laughs> so, now, so now I go, oh, it was, uh, I forget the name of it even now, what the name of the beach club is. So I respond. So he goes, oh, okay, well, and then he responds back. To, I respond with the name of the beach club. And he's like, well, yeah, that must, you know, things that just Americans drink. And I'm like, but... I had that drink in Italy at an Italian beach club, but most of the people at the beach club were Italians. Mm -hmm. Italy. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, now, nah. and, and then he's commenting on other things that I'm making on my mm. page. And, you know, he, uh, it was like, I had like one of my viral videos on TikTok was a, a, a sauce that I make, an easy Sunday sauce with sausage. And he commented, you know, you Italian Americans think you know Italian food, but you don't. Mm -hmm. I responded back and I said, you know what? I'm just trying to share my family's recipes and inspiring to people in the kitchen. I'm not saying that you would find this exact recipe on a table in Italy. Right. But you're, please don't come on my page with your negativity. And that's right. how I, and then I blocked him because I was like, right. I can't. No, anymore. exactly. You know? I mean, you're right. Like, and my response to that is exactly what I told you. you. You're in Italy and there's different regions. There's different dialects. There's different cuisine. It's all over Italy. Italians came to this country and formed these little enclaves all over the country and developed their own things based on economics, you know, uh, ingredients that were available to them. The dialect changed a little bit. So, you want me to respect that, that in Italy of what it is. And this is what I grew up with. You have to respect that also. And, right. you know, that's really my response to it. You know, you know, I almost consider it as this is where like another region is a part of Italy. This is our own dialect in Brooklyn, our right. own way of cooking things, our own, you know, I know you can't find chicken parmigiana in, in, in Italy. I know. Right. But it's good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so you're going to sit there and you're going to start criticizing me because I'm posting a video about what's right. really it's great. And you know what? Italians in Italy should be proud of the fact that they can influence food so much so in a country like America. So that, that's really what my response is to that, I guess. And I think that's a great response. And and uh, our, our food writer, I mean, he's in Italy, and we've talked about this. I, I would love, and our second largest audience, and if anybody is watching up until this point or reading the article, our second largest audience is from Italy. And oh, wow. it could be English-speaking people who have moved to Italy, but it's also Italians because you can read the, the website in Italian or Spanish if you want to. And I did some digging, but I'm not of the expertise to really go into this. But I think what Dina says is great. It would have been literally impossible to take Italians who have migrated into the United States or let's say Argentina into different from different regions and to preserve that because there is an economical thing. And one thing that I read is also there is eventually some affluence. We had easy access to meat and protein and um, it was sustainable for people who are not able to have like the midday meal or whatever. All of these habits change. And what you have is like this merging of all these different things that became now what is the Italian American or the Argentinian Italian 
culture. It's a different culture. You're not trying to compete with Italy. You're not trying to replicate exactly. You've become your own. And I think one of the things that you really emphasize is one of the most beautiful things that has not changed between the two countries is the fact that eating at the table. Yes, I agree. It's still key, right? Yes. Yes. And eating at the table and maintaining those family relationships. Um, I think it's just even important to like good health, like, right. you know, having those healthy family relationships where you're all together and, you know, you still get to see each other at holidays. And like I said, like even during the pandemic, like it was important to us, mm-hmm. and, you know, that having that family connection, you know, I'll never forget right after the pandemic hit having Easter by ourselves and it, and it was literally my husband and myself and my kids, it was their dad's year to have them at Easter. So my husband and I made Easter dinner by ourselves. And then we zoomed with our family on the phone and it's just, it wasn't the same. It was heartbreaking. It was, you know, uh, it, you know, we all like were sending each other text messages that morning that, you know, cause we did make the Easter bread via a zoom call also my grandmother every year made her um easter breads and we all partook in it even to this day we still do that um as a family but during the pandemic we zoomed and made them and you know everyone's like oh did you eat nanny's bread and you know easter bread and it was hard and right but the beautiful thing about all of it is that this culture that's so surrounded by family and love and food has now migrated to the United States and t- morphed into other type, another type of Italian American cuisine. And I think that needs to be respected. I mean, certainly not all of it's good. Like if you watch the pasta queen on TikTok, and she'll, you know, yeah, do- I do. People are like putting pasta in one pot and throwing ingredients on it and then sticking it in the oven in a pan. Like it's some of it is like, okay, like cringe worthy. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, Italians who came here and have passed these recipes down, you know, from generation to generation, you know, it's gotta be respected and, you know, criticizing it or, you know, putting your nose up in the air a little bit to it, you know, is I don't think necessarily the kindest, nicest thing, you know, right. you do. So, no, I agree with you. And um, I think that's excellent. And, and one thing I would say quickly before we go into your, um, onto your, your home in Tuscany is that one thing that I noticed I was following, like, I won't give it away, but I, depending on when this video is published, but you know, our September interview is from Abruzzo and I was following his recipes and I said, you know, I really want to follow your pizza dough recipe, but it's impossible to get fresh yeast. <laughs> I even looked on Amazon. <laughs> and so it's funny. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but one of his following videos he showed. So he was like telling me and that that's key. Like, I mean, that, that that's, you know, it's so readily available in Italy, but if you can't find it here automatically, I mean, even the water <laughs> or the olive oil, oh. it's going to change things. It is. And, you know, when I go there, the incredible thing to me about food in Italy, and I talked to you about this already, is how it's it, there's less processed foods. The markets, um, and certainly growing up in Brooklyn, the markets were small. Like you had your Italian American markets. When my grandfather wanted to get fish, we went down to the docks, and I right. he brought. And we got the fresh fish for a Friday dinner or, you know, we went to the Brooklyn terminal market and picked up our vegetables there. And things have certainly changed now since the seventies and eighties. Um, right. As far as how our food is treated and GMOs and yeah. Great on our food that make us sick. Right. And when I go to Italy, the purity and uh, of the ingredients, even the taste of the vegetables, right. it's like, you eat a, eggplant there and you could taste eggplant here obviously but then you go there and you have an egg have an eggplant and it tastes like a magnified version of an eggplant like yeah i I 
hope I'm describing it the right way. But no, I remember that. I remember like, you know, in Rome, you know, we were by a market there and the spinach, like it was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, like it, I don't get spinach like that here. Or, or the fact that, you know, okay, it's not in season, so you're not going to make it. You know, exactly. like, exactly. you know, you're not going to go to the store and find it. And, you know, I, I'll never forget, like, I think I was in Italy at one point where there was str beautiful strawberries, but then it was like, I was there for a certain amount of time. And then a couple of weeks later, there was no strawberries. And I was in a different area. And I remember saying to the guy, can I have some strawberries? Cause they were so good. He's like, oh, they're out of season now. So no more strawberries. And this was like a mad few weeks, you know, like that's it. No more like, you know, and I just, I wish that in America here that we could focus more on quality of food and i try to put even in some of my posts like a good quality olive oil quality ingredients you know even lately now more so um you know uh looking at the, the ingredients of the processed foods that we eat you know like right. just because it's fda approved doesn't mean it's good for you so right. you know, it's I agree. It's a situation where, you know, I, I want people to be conscious. And if you could make your own, pick out quality ingredients, make a quick meal for your family and have a meal with your family. I mm -hmm. mean, if I could influence people to do that through my followers, like I, when I get a note saying, I sat down with my family and I made your, I don't know, let's say I made your bean soup the other night. Um, mm -hmm the pasta fagioli or whatever. Some lady sent me this beautiful message the other night, how she got her kids to eat broccoli because I posted a bro broccoli and cavatelli um, uh, video. And mm -hmm. I got my son to eat broccoli. And, you know, just something, if I can influence someone, you know, a few people, a lot of people, I mean, that just makes a big difference for me and it makes it rewarding. Almost like when I would influence kids in a classroom when I was teaching. And I knew I influenced them in, in a good way and, you know, and taught them morals and family and how important certain things are. You know, I, I like, if I could still do that through this, you know, then I'm doing my job. Yeah. And I believe you are. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, look, look what you've done in, in less than two years. That's incredible. So um, let's move on to okay. the dream home. <laughs> How did that idea come about? I'm going to guess it's yours. <laughs> um, so uh, what do you want to know? Like, do you want to know how I first started? Yes, the idea right from scratch. Okay. When did the idea came, come about? And then, you know, tell us about, you know, the process of buying. Go into the whole thing as much as you like. All right. So a lot of people say, oh, your family's Southern Italian. Why are you buying in Tuscany? Mm. It is. I fell in love with the movie Under the Tuscan Sun as a kid. Mm. And I could recite every line to that movie i watched it a million wow. times and then when my husband and i went there to plan our wedding it's there's something about that area that just has my heart and i know my family's not from there and the cuisine is so much even different yeah, than different. than i cook you know mm -hmm. but uh where i grew up with and but i just love it i love the val Dorcha. i love the there's a piece of when you look out your window and you see those rolling mountains and all the mm -hmm. green and i it's very calming to me and my life here in new york is not calming right it non-stop my husband runs his own business you know we had five kids you know up until recently when they went to college we were literally non-stop there would be weekends where we would be at 10 different events for the kids between saturday and sunday shuttling them all over tournaments in other states you know i mean now for my son he plays in college so it makes it all worth it you know yeah and, um, yeah you know it's you know, when I go there, it's like I'm, I relax and I feel at home. And so when we got married there, we fell in love with that area in Montalcino and it's famous for Brunello and we love our Brunello. Mm -hmm. And so we made friends there when we got married there. So one of my really good friends, Fulvia, she lives in Montalcino. Our first time going to Montalcino for the wedding you know, it's November, it's cold, we're staying in Montalcino, hardly anything is open. And her and her husband had this pizzeria. 
My husband and I walk in as two Americans on a Sunday and she, we will ask her, she has a TV and we're like, do you think you could see if we can go or give us computer, your Wi-Fi that we can get the Jets football, American football on our, t- on our computer. So she is like doing whatever she could for us, like to try to get us the Wi-Fi. It wasn't working. I mean, you know, keep in mind it's 2014, you know, the advancements even that we've made since then. And we're sitting there and she couldn't do enough for us. So out of that night built a friendship because we ended up having our rehearsal dinner there. And now she sold the pizzeria and she owns a bed and breakfast that we stay at when we're in Montalcino. And now I'm trying to convince her to come to America and visit us Uh and go there. You know, we, um, we visit her and we have dinner and she's a beautiful person. And we created these relationships when we were there planning our wedding and then on, in, in trips after that. And during, right. But we had talked about maybe, Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a villa in Tuscany, you know, like mm-hmm. kind of. Thing. And then during the pandemic, again, we started cruising the internet and my husband still went to work. His company was open because he's in building products. So it was considered I guess, essential. So he was right. still going to day, but you know, on the weekends, we weren't taking the kids to all those events. They weren't in existence. So mm-hmm. we were fam- mm-hmm. first time home with our whole family, not running around like lunatics. So we researched and then we started making contacts at real estate agencies and in Italy, in Italy, right. uh, we, one home that we really loved right side of, outside of Montalcino, two architects had built it and um, we loved it. And we actually did a Zoom call with the real estate agent. Um, we actually put in an offer. It was so beautiful. We put in an offer during the pandemic that they rejected. So we're like, all right, well, let's see what happens. You know, let's let's wait until we can go to Italy to really um, pursue this dream. So. It opens up last year to us, you know, uh, August, September. And my husband and I had planned a trip to go see Andrea Bocelli in Tuscany. Oh, that's a dream of mine. (laughs) That's his uh, home. (laughs) uh, It's funny because during the pandemic, again, in the Italian American magazine, the NIAF magazine, the National Italian American Foundation, we saw an advertisement for a Bocelli concert, once in a lifetime thing. You get to go to his beach club and see a concert. So my husband, he's crazy, you know, he's like, let's do it. And I'm like, all right, really? It's a pandemic. You really want to book this trip? And he's like, yes, let's just do it. Hopefully, let's remain hopeful. And we'll go look at houses then. So we did. We went to Italy last September. They opened up, you know, uh, to us again. And by that, my cousin who lives here and is a real estate agent, um, was at that time for Sotheby's, put us in contact with the real estate agent there. And about a month before we traveled, she sent us nonstop listings. So we narrowed it down to listings at all price points. And people have asked me, like, Dina, how could you afford to buy a home in Italy? And, you know, what does it cost? And yes, I don't want to reveal it's personal to me. That yeah, of course. And we don't want to know. Either. What I tell people is know what you would want to spend. Like if you have a budget and you could spend a certain amount of money on a home, a vacation home, even if here in the States, if you had that dream, like have an idea of what you want to spend and then kind of look at home. It's like kind of the same process you would do in finding a home here in America. You look at, or HGTV, you watch all those shows. Like you look at the high end home, but then right. you can have, but then you look at maybe something really in the middle and mm-hmm. is it a fixer upper? Is it something that you want to do? Um, and for me, I'm always, I like everything now. Like even my home now, we redid everything, you know, my style. And um, so for me, I really had loved that home that we found over the internet. So that was one of the homes that the real estate agent sent us. But this home was fully done, but it was exquisite. And it was definitely on the high budget, um, you know, scenario for us. Right. So did go to see that home when we were there in Tuscany and it was stunning. Um, but there was still things that necessarily weren't my style and I didn't want to change it. I would want to change it. Then, so we looked at homes in the high price range or higher price range. Mm-hmm. Then we looked at homes 
like that were townhouses right in the village of Montalcino in the middle range. But then again, we wouldn't be able to have a large amount of family there. And it was really important to us that we have a lot of, we have five kids that they would want to come there with their kids and our family can go there together and that we have the room for everybody. So then we looked at a home that literally was, you had to run electricity and plumbing from the main road, it was dirt, they, it was just a structure. Um, we looked at that. Then we looked at uh, some other properties. And then we came to our home that we pur- just purchased in December. And mm-hmm. as soon as I pulled up, as soon as I pulled up, I said, this is it. And Peter looks at me, my husband goes, what do you mean? I go, I'm telling you, I knew this was it. And the blue doors and the, you know, the blue trimmed uh, windows and the, the, the icon of the Virgin Mary right above the front door. And for me, religion is always a really important yes. thing. Um, I just fell in love. And this house needed so much work, not as much work as the home that needed the electricity and the plumbing. Right. Um, you know, uh, brought from the main road. I mean, that's a little crazy. And, yeah. you know, the region sat down with us and, and she said to us, is this something that you really want to do from another country? Yes, a lot of questions. And mm-hmm. our agent, her name was Francesca. She was fabulous. So not only did she bring us to all these homes and she was incredibly friendly and, and gracious, but she really laid out for us what the whole experience would be. Mm-hmm. And she had a tremendous amount of assets for us, good architects, good contacts. You know, here we are as two Americans buying in another country. You know, I don't speak the language fluently. Right. I can buy, but, you know, I- I'm not to read documents. So uh, through her, we were, uh, you know, she put us in contact with some good people and we decided an offer in on the house that was accepted the homeowners are american that built oh. that had, um they were a couple uh who bought the home and then decided they didn't want to renovate it they bought end up finding something somewhere else they liked better mm-hmm. and they put this out in the market again and we bought the home from them um and you know, it's interesting because in Tuscany, when you go to do a construction project, I don't know if people realize this, but the laws are really strict. So right. you have to take whatever existing structure there is, and you can't make major changes to the outside of it. Right. It's a historical you thing. You can't buy a piece of property in Tuscany and say, oh, I want to build a high-rise hotel or a, mm-hmm. a home. My view will never change. My beautiful view of the Val d'Orcia in my backyard will never change. And I'm thankful for that. I'm yeah. thankful they hold on and they preserve that culture, that part of the structure and the beauty of Italy. And but you know what? I don't mind if I have to uh, 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 abide by those rules. Um, right. That, you know? And I basically... And just our home was an old farmhouse. So mm-hmm. I wanted me to get into the history of the home. But, but um, I don't know. Do we still have time to yeah, do that? No, no, there's time. <laughs> Go ahead. The home was an old farmhouse. It was originally the first floor is where the animals lived. Mm-hmm. And floor is where the farmers lived. And then there's a little annex um, that was like the barn. Okay. So at some point in the back of the house, there was where the pigs would come in. There was these little holes that they would come in and out. So at some point they, um, they must've patched those up. Like, and, uh, the second homeowner, I think was a Japanese couple, believe it or not. The guy was a pilot. The, um, the wife always wanted to uh, own, uh, a home in Tuscany. So what they did was, is they sort of renovated the home um, to where they patched up where the animals came in and they put windows there. So you can do that because it was a pre-existing structure or, or cut out. Right. You can go there as opposed to where the animals lived. So um, they patched up. You could still see where the, the difference in the bricks, where the, where the animals went through. And what she did was, this woman, is she... 
uh, lived upstairs and she made a basic kitchen downstairs um, with a, a living room area um, mm -hmm. and did it out. They put in a permit for the pool, I guess, and put the pool in, which is very difficult to do in Tuscany. That's mm -hmm. why that was us to this house. It had a pool and we didn't have to go through all of the permits and everything right. like that. Um, and then, um, but it was very basic still, like the heating, the air condition, the plumbing. I mean, it still needed a lot of work. So I guess this other couple that we bought it from, bought it from them, thinking that it was going to be their home, but then found something else. And then they sold it to us. So now since December, um, through our real estate agent, once we, you know, we found our lawyer through our bank. So, uh, he's in Florence. Uh, he's amazing too. Um, and you know, so many people are like, don't trust Italians. Oh my God, you're going to get robbed. Oh, this, this, that I have had the completely opposite experience. I've had people that have been nothing but, I mean, listen, I grew up in Brooklyn. I know, I, you know, streetwise, you're always taught to be on guard. Don't trust anyone. Right. But my experience has been completely the opposite than what people warned me about. And thankfully so far it's been, it's been really good. Um, you know, a lawyer we found through our bank and he helped us. With now, are you talking about, can I ask that you're talking about the lawyer you found through your bank? It's a bank in Italy. Uh, yeah. You're, yes. you're financing well, through Italy. Well, no, our bank, uh, you can, so there's two, obviously you could pay cash for your home. You could do a mortgage, it, you know, any way is good for you financially. Right. Um, we found our lawyer through our bank here. We okay. found there and ah. he, who, he's in Florence and he was able to set up everything for us. So he took Excellent. care of, of, you know, um, the act, they don't call it a closing in Italy. Like mm -hmm. you, like for a home here, you call it, I'm going to my closing for my home there. They call it the act and you mm -hmm. sit and go through and you read through the entire 20 page document of, um, you know, your home and all of the rule, a lot of the rules are listed in there for Tuscany and the conditions and, uh, you know, with the new home, with the old homeowner. So he was able to take care of all of that for us. Um, and our real estate agent, you know, the two of them worked hand in hand together. Um, we had to open up an Italian bank account, which interesting enough, you have to have an Italian phone to open, at least this is what we were told. You have to get a phone in Italy, like an Italian phone. So my husband and I had to go to a store, like a best mm -hmm. Italian Best Buy, purchase an iPhone, set it up in Italian and have the phone. Then we opened up our bank account and, you know, we were guided by um, our friends there and we were guided by our attorney and, you know, mm -hmm. go to the, speak to this person. And that's what we did. Right. And, while we were there in December um, with our real estate agent, we met with an architect that she had used before and trusted. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, Mira and Lorenzo are amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, first of all, they're the kindest people. They are so responsive and their work is beautiful. I mean, you know, certainly the starting of the work took a couple of months. Even though we bought the house in December, the works didn't start until like April, right. but they lot to plan out um, a lot to go to the village of Montalcino with. Um, and they did all that for us. Um, uh, our real estate agent had a friend who is a property manager. So she does this for other people that live there. So, or have homes there that are Americans. So she gave us her number and now she's a friend. Her name is Elena and she lives in uh, Montepulciano. Her family owns a bed and breakfast there. And she has an incredible amount of contacts in the area. And so she put it, uh, our real estate agent put us in contact with her. They're high school friends. This is what she does. So my husband's like, we definitely need someone over there that God forbid, you know, there's a break in at the house or there's a fire. Right. Like someone that we could, that we have on call that could help us. And you know what? So we hired her and yes, it is an extra expense every month, but it's not that much money to be quite honest. She's, she's goes over and beyond. And, you know, we trust her with 
okay, she had, makes the transfers for us from the bank to the builder, to the guy who's making our kitchen cabinets. So, you know, because she came recommended to us, it wasn't just some Joe Schmo off the street. Right, right. She has really helped us. And now her boyfriend loves the home so much. Mm -hmm. His background is construction. He wanted to go there and cut the lawn every week. So he said, it's too beautiful not to cut the lawn every week, even though you're in construction. He's like, buy me a, a you know, a, a sit down, uh, you know, mower. Yeah, mower. Yeah. Go there and I'll mow your lawn every week. So he goes and he mows the lawn. He sends us pictures of the, like the sunset or, you know, one oh. more sunrise. And they're so wonderful. These people, they, they love, they love that Americans are there, you know, like, I think that they, especially you have to go into the pandemic and the tur tourism and how much it hurt them. Of course. Like, to have us there, they're happy. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's, so now that's basically the process. That's my experience of going through the whole process and how I found my home. And so now starting in April, we did complete reconstruction of this home. It's been slow, you know, there's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of La Dolce Vita involved in right. you know, it. Like the whole month of August was basically shot because yes. travels. And you know what? That's what I love about it. Good. And you know, I'm I am okay with it. And the quick paced New Yorker that I am, like, I'm okay. That's their life. You know, that's how they enjoy life. Like, I'll never forget the first time that we went to meet the construction people. And the construction at this point had started at the house already. They were there. There's basically little, there's electricity to the home, but only a few working outlets. And there you have these guys in hard hats. You walk in and there's a little hot plate and a little mocha pot. A guy is making his espresso. And he's like, do you want espresso? And I walk in and I'm like, this is great. I'm like, yeah. here they are. It's, you know, 10 in the morning and there's hardly any electricity. Nothing works in this home. And there they are just having their little espresso. And they, you know, we walk in and they're all sending around and, you know, took a break with us and we got to know them. And, you know, now we know the guys and, you know, it's just been a very fun experience and, you know, budget wise for people who, want this experience it's the same thing as if you buy a home here and you're reconstructing it you have a budget but you always go over budget for the most part right, right. You know, i bought this home my husband and i back i think in 2016 that i'm in now here in new york and we had a budget we moved in and you, then you pick out things that you like better or you run in <laughs> we've all done that you know yeah. my part, problem there is we had an issue with mold because the home hadn't lived in for a long time and we had to have someone come in they had to you know hire someone to check it out to then we had to cut out a part of the wall where the mold grew and replace it and uh that was an extra added expense that you don't expect it's like when you watch hgtv and they have to go to the homeowner and say you know we got to spend a thousand dollars on this right same thing there right you know, I think if you have, it's definitely, if you have a budget and you know what you can't go over, but you have your middle ground budget, I mean, it's definitely attainable for people to do if you have those kinds of means. And I never thought this was possible. I, in my wildest dreams, when I was running restaurants, working 80 hours a week, did I ever think dreaming of Italy and watching Under the Tuscan Sun, yeah. you know, did I ever think that I was going to have a home there? Never, never, but it's a possibility. Yeah. And it could be a possibility at really any one of budget where people would want to have a vacation home. Because we certainly looked at houses at all price points and we found a home that best fit ours, like you would do here. Right, right. I, 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 think, I think you offer some great advice for anybody's knowing. Um, we've, we've talked, obviously, other people who've tried to do it, you know, without the, the, the experts, but obviously starting from a great referral in Italy and then moving outwards and having good people and, and being re realistic in many ways. And I think one of the great things that you've embraced as well that we've found too, talking to foreigners living in Italy, it seems like everybody across the board says, 
take your foreign ideals and expectations and leave them at the door because this is Italy and your experience. And it's actually the experience you should be going into another country. You can't expect things to happen the way they do at home. Right. Right. So rather than getting frustrated with it, embrace it and understand the way it is. So I think that's key. So you have one more child to get through college. What are your plans? Are you hoping to spend how many months in Italy or have you Um, thought about that? Well, my husband has his own business, as I said. So he's looking maybe in like five to six years to retire. But there's certainly things that he can do from home or let's say abroad, you know, even with the time difference. Um, So, you know, we do have my littlest, Andrew, um, who's still home with us. And in two years, you know, he'll be in college. So I think our plan would be is, you know, go with our families together as much as possible. Like Mm -hmm. when the kids fall off in the summer, go do the Italian summer. Um, Use the house as our base kind of, you know, where we have our stuff. And I think that's one of the things that I most look forward to is because I hate packing and I always overpack. It's just the way I am. I'm just excited to have my own set of stuff there. Right. And I, would, I, I want to basically, you know, we could use our home is so centrally located that we can get to so many other places for mm. a night or a day trip and just kind of experience that with the kids maybe in the summers. And then once Andrew goes to uh, college, um, I would think that we would spend more time there, like maybe six weeks at a time if we could. Um, You know, the fall is busy for us here because, as I said, my son plays football here. Right. I want to go to his college games. But certainly, um, you know, after that, maybe spend six weeks there, maybe even do a holiday there with my family. You know, my sister has two little ones um, and we talk about just picking up and going there for a couple of weeks together and hanging out and going to the beach next summer. You know, um, once hopefully we have our big family reunion there, uh, I'm hoping it's my uh, parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary last year, next year, hoping that we could have, you know, the reunion of our wedding, not for us, but for them there. And have oh, our be beautiful. Go and have it at my home this time, not a Costello band fee, just to have it at my home. And, you know, whoever can stay with us stays with us um, right down the road. Now, also, my home is about two miles up a dirt road, which is typical in Tuscany. Mm-hmm. You have your beautiful paved, regular roads that get you everywhere. But then a lot of these streets where these homes exist are white dirt roads. And, our home, you know, the first time you up to the home, you're like, wow, this is definitely off-roading, you know? And the city girl in me, I, I'm here I am in the country, literally. Like, my yeah. family thought to Long Island was the country. Yeah. <laughs> and I love every, the New York City girl loves everything about this. So I would like to get there as much as I possibly can. Um, but at the same time, be here for my kids when they need me. So that's the plan. It sounds like you can have the best of both worlds. I I hope it. (laughs) You'll get there. Look where you've gotten so far in life. (laughs) Yes. But we'll see. I'm thinking by Christmas, it should be done. Right. So as you know, this series of the magazine or this part of the magazine is called uh, chat with an expat and it rhymed and it was cute, but as it has evolved, some people just hate the word expat. You are not an expat as yet. I don't know if you could share whether or not you be, and plan on becoming, you know, a dual citizen or anything, but you do. Okay. Yes. That's great. I like to do that. However, I just want to do things in baby steps. So right. our thing, you know, let's do it. Let's do the home. Let's, you know, go and experience it this way, you know, having it as a vacation home. And then I have actually spoken to the lawyer about uh, becoming a dual citizen, but in the baby stages of it, no real details, but it's definitely. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think you definitely have to think about the home first because this is another process within itself. It's going to yeah. take your focus. So 
not so much expat, but what is your view of someone who's a foreigner? Because even though you're Italian American, moving per se, it won't be permanently to Italy. I mean, I think that it's definitely attainable. And it's funny because now I follow a lot of people on social media who have done it, even non Italian Americans. Mm -hmm. um, go there and find the way of life completely welcoming and easier and refreshing and, you know, the food and the culture. So I definitely think that it's a possibility. And, you know, I, I just think that experiencing it when you live there and the culture is such a beautiful thing. And I certainly think it's an attainable Att attainable thing to do and you know certainly learning the language is, is is key for a person going into a foreign country but most people in italy speak english right they, i didn't know that <laughs> i mean a lot of um, in my experience a lot of people do speak some sort although of i do know that dealing with the magazine but i, I was thinking of, more once you're there it might not be the case languages in high school and and school and you know it's a different educational system than here and a lot of people speak english i mean maybe some of them not great english but you know a lot of you can get by and you know and even when you try to attempt to speak it i, I find that they're very receptive to it even my broken italian that i try to you know i can understand about 80 percent of it but my verbalization is terrible. My grammar is terrible and I'm not confident. So I don't usually, I usually speak back to them in English. Right. So, um, but I certainly hope that, you know, as I go on and I'm there more and I learn more conversational Italian, that it'll get better. And a lot from what I've seen of people who do make the full move there is that they go, they have, they find great friends they learn the language and they end up having a really great experience. And that's certainly, you know, I'm not a full expat is what you would call like who's living there permanently. But from what I've seen, that's, you know, definitely a possibility. That's great to know. So it's probably too soon because you haven't really spent a lot of time there just yet. But from what you can see when you are in Italy, is there anything that you kind of miss? And I'm not talking about friends and family that from the United States that you can't find in Italy. Oh, I mean, for sh I mean, the convenience mm -hmm. of certain things like like my home doesn't have an address like there's when you go for the paperwork, there's no like, oh, this is Dina and she lives at 30, you know, Main Street. They, my block, my road doesn't have an address. And so even to get an Amazon package or, you know, it's the, the quick accessibility to things that we have here in America, like instant gratification. Oh, I could order on Amazon right now and have it tomorrow. It's not like it is there. Like, you know, you don't have a target. Like one of the first questions I was asking my girlfriend, I was like, so like, where do you go to buy towels? Like, mm -hmm go to buy certain things and there's certainly stores that have things convenience like that but there's no like mega target or a walmart where you can go and like get anything you want so you know even though for the most part i really appreciate my small stores my specialty stores with good quality things the things like you would get as an american at target at from amazon like i think that to me the convenience of that is something that i miss the most when I'm on there mm -hmm. and miss believe it or not like American cuisine because I think the beautiful thing in America is we have all these amazing cultures that have come together and there's so many especially here in New York the food is amazing here in New York as far as like the restaurants and the different cuisines that you could get and you know I I find that when I'm there in Italy like I miss like a good old you know American bar food kind of a thing Right. You know, and I think you are definitely are, not the first person to say that it's yeah, quite I, understandable to, to, to not have that choice and miss. I, it. 
go out for Indian any night of the week or, you know, sushi. And, you know, they do have sushi restaurants in Italy. They do. And there's some sort of fusion places. But for the most part, it's pasta, pasta, you know, Italian dishes. So being an American, yeah, you have your Italian, your pasta, your, your restaurants. But then you, you have any night of the week, you can go for Chinese, Japanese. Right. Indian, whatever. I mean, Ethiopian, you name it here in New York, especially. I mean, Argentina. And even close to my home, there's so many different cultural, you know, cuisine restaurants. But I think that's something that I miss when I'm there is like just having like good old American bar food. Yeah. You know? Football Sunday bar food, you know, kind of thing, you know? Right. And you'll probably, this came up in our very first interviews, like getting the proper satellite so you can get those football games over there. <laughs> yes, and we've talked about that. And you can. There are ways. Yeah. There are ways. So I could still watch my Yankee games, even though it's going to be in the middle of the night in Italy. I can still watch them. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah. So there are ways. You know, technology has come a long way. And you know, even now I have a camera on my phone. I have an app and I can watch everything that goes on at my house. Right. I have an alarm system, which a lot of people told me was very necessary, which and warned me about experiences. And mm -hmm. that goes to any country. You know, you go, or even here. I mean, I get sure. ring on my phone, phone daily now about car break-ins in my area. And so it's, it's just being safe, you know? Yeah. Um, so the fact that we won't be there all year, what if a squatter comes in? Yeah, no, uh, no obviously, if you're going to own a home abroad, these are things that you have to think about and obviously expenses. Yep. Yeah. So security was priority for us. That's the first thing we did was we put security cameras in, we put an alarm system in, um, and then certainly God forbid, if anything happens, we have Elena, our property uh, manager there who can go to the home instantaneously right and take care of it yeah that's key that's Couple definitely minutes. something to keep in mind um any of you that are looking well it's been a great pleasure uh you I, the, last year we talked about italian american heritage month but uh, i think you have been the perfect fit um, we'll be kind of highlighting some businesses that have been following us on Instagram and one of uh, the other articles as well. Um, and it's just so great to know. And I think a lot of our Italian readers will, will really appreciate your insight. So once again, tell us how to find you starting with the website and we'll um, put all those links below. So all of my handles are the same. Uh, Micha Mama is M-I-C-I-A-M-A-M-M-A-S. And that's on Instagram, on TikTok, um, and just new on Facebook, although I'm not I'm trying to navigate the whole Facebook world because I'm not really familiar with it. Uh, and it's the same handle, uh, same uh, website name, Meet Your Mamas. Um, so you could certainly find me there. I do try to post about the house as much as I can. We're going back sometime in October for like the next phase of, of visits to, you know, go there and pick out Excellent. furniture. We're at that point. Um, so sometime in October, I... On the whole process, and I do like try to share them as much as possible. Sorry for my dogs. No, that's okay. That's life in a home. It's been it's been a long chat, and he's he's been really good up until this point. So don't worry about that. You've got three dogs. Yes, yes. One wow. is a. Italian dog. She's my salami loving Kanye Corso. So yeah. <laughs> oh, cute. Wow. Yes. Well, uh, I'll conclude this by saying that we are Live in Italy magazine. It's www.liveinitalymag.com. And you can find us obviously on YouTube. So please subscribe and anywhere else on social media at Live in Italy Mag. It's been a pleasure. And please, if you're not following Dina, you're interested about food and who isn't, we've talked about this before, who doesn't love Italian food or great family tips and recipes um, or follow. I certainly will be following your journey as you find your Tuscan son. 